This is Sid Haas. I'm the Vice President of Business Development with LKCS, and today's webinar is focusing on um, our web services. Uh, not so much on our web design services, but some of the ancillary web services and web marketing services, um, you know, that, that we feel our clients um, would be would be well served taking advantage of. Um, all the things I'm going to talk today talk about today um, are completely independent independent of our web development services. So even if you're not a website customer of ours, if we didn't design or host your website, um, you can still utilize all the different uh, you know services whether we provide them or or uh, other firms provide the services that we're going to be talking about. For those of you not familiar with LKCS, I have one slide that tells you a little bit about the company. We were founded back in 1961, and we currently serve financial institutions primarily, um, and we serve customers in about 48 states. So while we started as a traditional printing and mailing company um, with traditional marketing services, obviously over the years, um, as we've grown, we've you know integrated into other areas um, and currently to provide a lot of different electronic services, many of which we're going to be talking about today. Um, but we have been designing websites for, you know, and providing all of these different services that we're going to be talking about, many of them for over 15 years. Um, we currently host uh, e-statements and provide processing, uh, statement processing processing services for about 200 financial institutions each month and work with, you know, up to, at any one time up to three or 400 different financial institution clients in a variety of marketing capacities. So as I said at the outset uh, of the webinar, um, you know, today's uh, presentation is not really on our web design and development services, um, but I do want to explain that we are really good at. So <laughs> there's a few examples on your screen here of different uh, different websites of ours. You know, we, we are launching, you know, a couple websites for financial institutions each month. Um, we're well aware of the latest web trends and all of that. So if you are uh, in the market for a web, you know, web redesign or a, a website, you know, a update, please feel free to, uh, to reach out to us. We'll be happy to get you additional information. And also not the focus of today's webinar is, is really maintaining your website. But maintaining your web website is extremely important to your online success. So as we talk about all of these different online marketing efforts and different services that you know you can take advantage of, many of them obviously you know will link back uh, to your website. So if you want to make sure that updating your website is, is easy for you. And with that, what we're finding, you know, as a trend over the last several years anyway with web development um, is certainly building sites with content management systems. Um, content management systems, for those of you not familiar with it, enable you to make just about all of the changes to your website on your own without any technical expertise or any programming, even the ability to create new pages you know, at will um, on your site. When it comes to content management, just so you know, LKCS typically recommends a product called Sitefinity. Sitefinity is a commercial source, um, a commercial um, content management system. Um, but there's a lot of open source options such as WordPress and Joomla that you may have heard of. Um, we think for financial institutions there are better options out there. Um, so we just want you to be wary of those open source solutions, primarily due to security risks. But we can talk about all of that further. Um, and then also when it comes to maintaining your website, regardless of whether it was built in a CMS or not, LKCS extends functionality of many of our clients' website with a tool suite that we offer, which makes it very, very easy for our financial institution customers to update things like rates or any customers to update their banner ad rotations, announcements on their websites, even manage, you know, how forms, when forms get submitted through the website, how those leads are processed through your organization. And we constantly update these enhancements, or we constantly update these tools with new enhancements and functionality, um, and we can integrate those, again, into your website, whether we've built it or not. So, um, again, we're not going to be talking about this in much more detail at all, but I just wanted to let you know that those services were available. So now I'm going to jump into some of these electronic services that you may or may not be aware of. Um, email hosting uh, is is really important now for organizations. You know, email is one of those things that everybody, you know, nobody sees there's a cost to it. We all take email for granted. You know, we all have multiple email accounts for personal reasons and obviously rely on our work email 
you know, all day, every day, and, and just expect it to be there. But when it goes down, obviously, it's a huge problem, and it ends up being a huge cost to the organization. When it comes to email hosting, LKCS actually has two uh, different email hosting solutions, and it really, uh, you know, depends on preference, um, you know, for what you need. And I'll discuss uh, both of those options. And again, these options are available from from other providers as well. But you know, a typical email hosting or, or traditional, I guess, email hosting is what we call call POP or IMAP hosting. POP and IMAP. Are, I guess you could say they're older technologies, um, but they're you know what the what the email was really built on. Um, they can absolutely be secure. Um, these mailboxes that we offer are large, so you know everybody has more and more stores, more and more email, and has larger and larger attachments. So when we host email for our clients at the Pop and IMAP. Uh, platform. Um, we actually have 25 gigabyte mailboxes and allow you to send and receive up to 50 megabyte attachments, which is really, really large. Um, this, these email accounts have premium anti-spam and antivirus solutions. So, you know, you will not have to spend a lot of your time at all filtering out, you know, junk email or anything like that. Um, they are fully SSL encrypted. So you don't have to worry about, you know, security, um, you know, of your email. And they are fully compatible with Outlook um, and other desktop mail clients. And there is a webmail um, feature available as well so that you can access your email from any web browser just like you would like a Gmail account uh, or a Hotmail account. These mailboxes enable you to set up multiple user aliases, so you can have as many email addresses for each account. So as an example, you know, my email address is sid.haas at lk-cs.com, but you could also email me at sid at lk-cs.com. Um, potentially, I could have an alias set up such as marketing at lk-cs.com. So all of those aliases point to the same email account. So when I check my email, I would get, you know, email sent to all of those addresses at one time. And our you know, POP and IMAP uh, do, offer, do offer a mobile sync capability. So we can push, you know, real-time emails, you know, out to mobile devices, phones and tablets, um, and even push your calendar and your contacts out to you. So that is all available uh, through POP and IMAP hosting. And, you know, when we talk about cost, you know, for POP and IMAP hosting, you're looking at a cost of $5 or less per mailbox per month, typically. We also offer Exchange hosting. Microsoft Exchange is a tremendous platform, been around for many, many years. It's a very robust email solution, provides some extended functionality over the POP and IMAP hosting, but it's also significantly more expensive due to Microsoft's licensing. Some of the advantages that um, Exchange offers um, is that we can have even larger mailboxes. So we enable you to have up to 100 gigabyte mailboxes with 50 megabyte attachment limits. Um, our Exchange hosting offers the exact same anti-spam and antivirus and SSL encryption as our POP and IMAP hosting. So um, these, these uh, solutions are the same. Um, one's not better than the other. Exchange does enable us to provide a solution called ActiveSync, uh, which is designed for iPhone and iPad and, and, and both Android and Windows phones. BlackBerry is also available. So ActiveSync serves as that real-time email, you know, synchronization and calendar syncing and contact syncing and tasks and all of those types of things that you might be used to. Um, our Exchange hosting, just like the uh, POP and IMAP, offer a full desktop and Outlook compatibility, and they also come with Outlook Web Access, which is Exchange's web, uh, web, web browser client. Um, one, a couple of big differences between Exchange hosting and, uh, and the secure POP and IMAP hosting um, is that we can have shared contacts. And what I mean by shared contacts is you can have address books that are shared across everybody in an organization. You can also have shared calendars, so um, everybody within the company could potentially see when other individuals are available, and you even have the ability to schedule resources such as conference rooms and, you know, company vehicles and all sorts of different things like that through your calendaring. 
Um, we can synchronize with Active Directory for any IT people on the on the call. So as you know, you change settings or add users to your network, they can actually you know automatically provision email accounts and and permissions and things like that. And Exchange also comes with Skype for Business. So you know if you're using some kind of you know online chat type solution um, exchange comes with Skype for business which is fully encrypted um, you know messaging instant messaging so. with that I will jump to email marketing email marketing is different than obviously email hosting email marketing is meant for you to obviously send um, email messages in bulk to different contact lists you know of your account holders or you know customers things like that if you're not utilizing uh, email marketing currently, you should be. Uh, email marketing is extremely effective and has been for our customers for many, many years. Um, you know, the latest statistics that I've seen from the Direct Marketing Association are that email marketing has an ROI of 4,300%. Email marketing is extremely inexpensive and, inexpensive and is, uh, is highly effective. You know, and again, that's as you can see here on the slide. That's why so many emails are sent um, annually. I'm not going to read all of these, but a few additional email marketing statistics that you should know about. Um, you know, just like web traffic, um, uh, you know, is, is going mobile. Obviously, email is going mobile. So 51% over half of all email now is opened on mobile devices. So what that means for you is select an email marketing solution that enables responsive design templates. You want your emails to format nicely both in, on a desktop computer and on, you know, and on a smartphone. Um, so you can see some of the other uh, other statistics here, other things to be aware of. Um, there's a lot of different email marketing solutions out there, a lot of very good ones and a lot of not so good ones. Um, you know, and it's really not only select a company that, that, you know, has a great solution, but also select people to work with that know a lot about email. So, you know, things like when to deliver an email um, are things that we're constantly watching and checking statistics of emails that are sent so we can provide guidance uh, to our clients on effective email. So our email, email marketing platform offers several advantages that some of the other ones don't. Um, when we start with an email marketing customer, a new customer, we obviously custom design a mobile responsive email template for each one of our clients that coordinates specifically with your branding standards. But then we integrate that template into the system that enables you to actually build your own emails if you want to. Our designers can certainly create email marketing messages for you. We have a very simple drag and drop, what you see is what you get editor that enables our clients, again, without any programming knowledge, to build and design their own emails. So that's an advantage that we have over some of the others where you have to import an HTML message or um, have some not so easy to use tools. And I'd be happy to demonstrate these to anybody that's interested. Um, and then our email marketing platform, and a lot of them, offers very flexible delivery. So you can select which lists of email addresses that you have that you want to send these messages to. You can set up different segments within those lists based on branch relationships or account relationships or you know demographics such as age and all sorts of different things, um, and decide when you want your message to be delivered. And obviously, you can send email messages immediately or you can schedule them, you know, ahead of time. And most email marketing platforms, I would hope all actually, provide results. So email is highly measurable. Um, we particularly like the how we present results in our platform um, because they're really, really nice looking and really, really easy to understand. Um, we say that our reporting, as it says here, is easy on the eyes and clear as a bell. So to give you an idea of what you're looking at um, in these screen captures is we show you right away the statistics um, of your mail campaign. So you'll see what we call an overall mailing score, which in this example is 7.7. .7. You'll see how that compares to the average um, in the industry. You'll also see the percentage of opens, the percentage of clicks, the percent of emails delivered. 
And then we provide a neat little click analysis map that shows you a heat map of where people who read the messages clicked. So what did they click on in the message? Where was it in the message? Where was it both on a desktop client and where was it in, in a mobile client? So as you continue to refine your email efforts going forward, you can design your messages based on where people are clicking. You'll see your opens by device comparing mobile to desktop, and you'll even see things um, you know, like which mail clients were used. So all of that information is available instantly in real time um, as messages are being delivered and obviously any time after uh, they've been sent out. Our email marketing platform and some of the others out there also enable marketing automation. So you can follow up on email activity with intelligence. So you can set up emails, and we can set these up obviously for you as well, but they can be triggered by actions that somebody takes after they receive your email. Maybe they click on a link. Um, they click on a specific link to some kind of uh, maybe a home equity promotion. And all of a sudden, you know, they're sent or queued up a follow-up email that goes out maybe in another couple of days, um, you know, after they click that link, maybe three days after they click the link, they get a follow-up email about home equity, um, you know, your home equity special. Uh, maybe an email is triggered when somebody signs up for your email list, you know, or when they celebrate a birthday. Um, you know, you have all that information at your fingertips, and we can trigger messages that go out automatically based on different actions. Our email platform comes with unlimited messages. So you pay a fixed cost per month based on the number of email contacts in the system. So the number of unique email addresses, basically, that we're hosting. And from there, you can send out as many messages as you want to that group of people at the same cost. It makes for very easy budgeting and obviously drives that ROI, you know, through the roof. Search engine optimization is the next subject uh, that we're going to be talking about. Um, search engine optimization is also known as SEO, and the concept behind search engine optimization is to optimize your website to improve your placement in search engine results. You know, we know, you know, that when somebody searches, um, you know, for any term in any of the search engines, that they are much more likely to click on one of the top five suggestions on the results page than anything lower than that. They're very, you know, much high, uh, much higher likelihood of them clicking on search results that appear on the first page of search results than going to the second page or the third page or beyond that. So search engine optimization, the goal is essentially to get your website listed ahead of your competitors and to also make sure that when people are searching for search terms that are relevant to your bank or credit union, that you know, they see your, you know, your website and the, and the most important pages relating to the search term that they're searching for. Good SEO practices improve the usability of your entire website because we'll uncover, um, you know, what's good and bad about navigating the website and how people are finding information on the website and the content on the website. And all of those things together, as they're improved, they improve both the usability of the site and obviously improve your placement in the search engine. SEO is not an easy thing. There's lots of components that influence where you appear in the search engine results. And there's two primary areas. One is what we call on-page SEO, which include things like title tags and meta tags, and most importantly, the body content, the actual content on those web pages. But it's also influenced by the website architecture. What is the path, you know, the actual directory path through your website, uh, where the search engines find different files and different pages, and how internal links are handled within the website between different pages. And there's also off-page SEO, which, you know, how many people are linking to your content externally. The, the um, search engines actually use that as a measure of, of the value of the content on your website. But they also know that people heavily abuse that, you know, and pay to be in click farms and different things like that, which can have a negative effect on search engine optimization. But the number of social media links, even if your website is protected by a security certificate or is responsive, now affect, 
your placement in search engine results. And the search engine algorithms are always changing. So these, you know, the search engines such as Google um, and Bing and Yahoo and all the other ones that are out there, you know, stay one step ahead of the people that are trying to, you know, fill websites with garbage just to appear higher in those search engine results. They want to make sure that the people who use their search engines find the most relevant information based on what they're searching for. You know, and they constantly change their search algorithms to improve those search results. Um, how we help is obviously we develop a unique, you know, we design a unique search engine strategy based on your needs and your market and, you know, your milestones and targets and goals. Um, obviously, we take care of on-page and off-page SEO, and we work to con continuously improve those. This, you know, search engine optimization is an ongoing effort. It's not something that, that you can just do once and then forget about. You know, you have to make some changes measure the results, see what's changed in those results, make more changes, and continue to improve it. But we will optimize your website for local search engine optimization because obviously when it comes to banks and credit unions, locality is extremely important, and it's also really important for the search engines. They realize that when people are searching for content, they would much prefer to do business locally as well. So, you know, we want to make sure that Google knows exactly where you're located. So when somebody is searching on Google that's close, you know, that's in your market, that again, your search engine results are displayed above somebody that's outside of your market. We'll conduct thorough research on what people are searching for, how they're finding you now, how you want to be found. And we'll make sure those keywords are built into the website and on, you know, into the content of the different pages to make sure that, again, your results are returned. And we provide reports. We'll show reports at the beginning of any search engine optimization engagement that show how your site ranks. And we'll provide those updates as we, you know, tweak and modify and make changes to those web pages to show you how, you know, how your positioning has changed. In all honesty and in all likelihood, some changes are going to be positive and some changes are going to be negative. So we need to know what changes we've made. We can see what has a positive impact, what has a negative impact. We remove the name, roll back the negative changes and, and, you know, tweak those until they're positive changes because we constantly want to see clients moving up higher and higher in those search results. So we'll jump over to online advertising. So, um, you know, your number one source, and uh, most Americans now, their number one source for information is the Internet. Um, you know, when you're shopping or researching, chances are you're going to the Internet first. And yet what we find with a lot of our clients is that their number one advertising medium is not the Internet. So there's a disconnect. Your members and customers are researching and shopping online. That's, you know, that's where they're finding their information. That's where they're, you know, uh, that's where they're active. So that's where you should be advertising. Now, I'm not telling you to drop all traditional advertising. You know, you're, <laughs> there's certainly value in, so, you know, still in some of the traditional um, marketing and advertising uh, media. But online ads are really, really important nowadays. And they're highly measurable and they're highly actionable. So when I say they're actionable, that means that people can click as they're researching and shopping and are active online and go directly to a landing page to take the action you want them to take, to buy, to apply for that account, you know, to open that account, to request information, to take some kind of action. We look at a newspaper ad, you know, or we hear an ad on the radio, and while we may be interested, we're not in a position to immediately take action on that ad. When I see the same content online, one click lets me take that next step and take that next action. So when it comes to online advertising, you have some options. Obviously, you can choose, oh, interesting, I apologize, my values dropped off of this, but they're on the PDF. Um, you have the option to, uh, to advertise on the search engines. And when you advertise in the search engines, obviously you can you then have to choose which search engines to advertise on. Google is the king of search. So what this graph was supposed to show you is that Google has like 77 or 78 percent of the search market. 
So meaning that out of 100 people, 78 of them are going to be use Google, are going to be using Google. If I was going to get started with search engine advertising, I would get started with Google for that very reason. Bing and Yahoo together actually is the same search engine and then utilizes the same advertising engine. And together they're actually right about 20%. And you can see the others fall below that. What's interesting um, is that there's a newer search engine that maybe many of you have not heard of called DuckDuckGo, which is actually growing pretty rapidly. They're still a minor player <laughs> in the search world, um, but they're bigger than a lot of their competitors, um, and they're growing quickly. Your other primary option when it comes to online advertising is social media advertising. And again, I apologize um, that, that these dropped off. But what this chart shows is that the majority of marketers that are buying social media ads are actually putting them on Facebook. That's what the orange segment here is. And it was roughly 43%, I want to say. Again, the, the PDF that you'll receive or that you can download um, from the attachment um, will give you the actual percentages. Um, uh, Twitter, um, I believe, was next. Um, YouTube is on there. I don't remember what, what all of them were. Uh, LinkedIn is on there as well. But Facebook um, is really the, the, the place to start. Um, Google Plus is on there as well. Okay. How it works when you start talking about online advertising, again, not only do you have to choose kind of where you want your advertisements to appear, but how you want to advertise. So you can do what's called pay-per-click or cost-per-click CPC. And what happens there is you literally are charged anytime somebody clicks on one of your ads. Not when they see the ad, but when they click on the ad to go to your website or whichever page uh, you know is linked to that ad. Many people will see your ad without clicking on it. You know, they still may visit your site on their own. You won't know that. There won't be any way to measure that, but you're not charged except for the people that click on the ad. It's a known cost per click. The way it works is it's actually an auction. So if you're willing to pay more than the next advertiser for that search term, you know, your ad's probably going to appear more than theirs. There's some, some you know, variation to that because Google and, and all the other search engines um, want to make sure your ad is relevant, you know, and, and is performing well. And if, if you have a highly performing ad, it may appear above ads that are actually costing more than yours. But for the most part, if you're willing to pay more than the next guy, your ad's going to appear more than his. You have the ability to set a budget for the campaign overall, or even a daily budget. Um, so you don't go over that budget. You may not reach it if not enough people are clicking on your ad. You may not reach that budget that you set, but you don't have to worry about going over that budget. The best uses for cost per click are if you want to accurately track the number of clicks your ads get. If you're a disciplined advertiser who sticks to your budget and doesn't get into bidding wars because it is an auction, you know, and you always want your ad to appear, it's very easy for you to start incrementally, you know, increasing the price you're paying for those ads. It's not usually a good move. Um, and, you know, the biggest reason to use cross click is if you want to advertise on high traffic websites and get the benefits of both clicks and exposure. In the majority of cases, we recommend cost per click or pay per click ads over your other option, which is pay per impression ad. So instead of cost per click, a cost per impression, which usually goes by the abbreviation CPI or CPM, you're charged now every time your ad is displayed, not every time it's clicked every time it's displayed. Pricing is established per 1,000 impressions. Um, so you know exactly how many times your ad's going to appear, to appear for your budget. You don't know many, how many people are gonna click through, but you, know, you, set a bu you set a budget and you'll know exactly how many times that ad's going to show. I can pretty much guarantee you that the search engines or the, or the, uh, the social media sites are going to use every bit of budget <laughs> you put out there 
You know, if that means they're going to show your web, you know, show your ad a hundred thousand times or a million times or a billion times until they use up that budget and the time frame you specify, they're going to use it up. So paper pre pay per impression or cost per impression is great if you um, realistically expect a very high click through rate on your ad. A cost per click ad is going to cost more per click than a cost per impression ad per 1,000 impressions. So if you just expect you know, that you're going to have a really high click-through rate, cost per impression may cost you less. But most importantly, if you're launching a new product or service or trying to build brand recognition and you really want to get the word out about what you're doing or what you're offering, pay per impression may be a way to go. Um, because, you're, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, an awareness-type campaign at that point. But really, in most cases, like I said, if you're advertising a specific product or service or a special, cost per click is typically going to cost you less and provide higher results than cost per impression, unless an awareness or a brand recognition campaign is really your goal. Also, with online advertising, you have some great ad targeting capabilities. So when it comes to Google and the search engines, you can target your ads based on keywords. So as people are using the search engines and searching for auto loans, we're going to make sure that if somebody is searching for auto loan in your market, that we can display an ad relating to auto loans. We can target ads by location. We can even target ads by device if that's important to you. Um, and we have the ability to do what's called retargeting or remarketing. And this is, you know, uh, somewhat new. It's been around for a few years now. But if you've ever been shopping on a shopping website, you know, Zappos is famous for it. I'll use them as an example. Uh, if I go to Zappos' website and look at a particular pair of shoes, um, that pair of shoes seems to follow me around the Internet. Bass Pro Shops, I'm a big fisherman. Bass Pro Shops is another one that uses it quite a bit. If I look at a particular fishing pole or fishing lure on Bass Pro Shops, that same fishing pole or fishing lure follows me wherever I go on the web. It's called retargeting. And the way it works is you can actually um, track people who visit a particular page on your website. And if they visit that page, they will then see ads relating to that page throughout you know, Google's or, uh, or Bing's ad network. We can talk about that in more detail if you're interested. And new to Google um, is a customer match. So now we can actually display ads to people based on their email address. So if you know everybody, just about, just about everybody has a Google account. You know, if you have a Gmail account, you have a Google account. If you... Uh, you know, there's just numerous reasons why you would have a Google account these days. Just about everybody has one, whether you know you do or not. That your Google account is associated with an email address. So if we upload a list of your customers or your members' email addresses, we can actually target advertising specifically to those email addresses. When it comes to Facebook and social media advertising, you have all of these targeting options and several more. Because of the information that you put into social media, um, we can target ads based by age and gender. We can target ads based on interests and behaviors and education levels and connections. So we can show ads to people that are already connected to your company or that aren't, or that are connected to friends, or, to connect, or that are connected to people that are already connected to you, um, as an example. And we can do the same type of customer match through a custom audience. Only there we can actually display ads based on both email address or phone number. So you've got a lot of different uh, ad targeting options for both the search engines and social media. You also have options for ad types. So you can have search ads, which are those text-based ads that appear with search results. And you can have display ads, which are graphical ads. They don't actually appear on Google search pages, but they will appear on YouTube and Gmail and other Google network sites. Um, and you can also boost your social media posts as examples of advertising. And when we say to boost a social media uh, post, what's surprising is that only a fraction of your social media users actually see your posts. So when you send out a Facebook post, as an example, only about 10 to 20% of the people that follow your page will see that post. 
Facebook will send it to others if they see that people are liking that post or clicking on that post or interacting with that post. If it's a popular post, Facebook will send it to more people. Twitter will show it to more people. If you want to show it to more people by your by yourself, you actually have to pay for it. Um, Facebook and, and Twitter are both generating uh, massive amounts of ad revenue, and one way they're doing that is through boosting your social media posts. It's very, you know, it's fairly inexpensive, and it could be well worth the cost, you know, for some posts. I certainly wouldn't post everything or boost everything that you're posting, but things that are important, you know, or, or product specials and things like that, content that you want a high number of people to see um, is worth boosting. And we can show you how to do that and how effective it can be. So when it comes to online advertising, we can help you build an online ad strategy. We can obviously research those keywords and, again, determine which keywords are going to get you the most bang for your buck when it comes to targeting ads. We will then help you determine how to target those ads, where those ads should run, whether they should be text-based ads or display ads or a combination. Obviously, we'll implement these campaigns for you, so we'll build out the campaigns, we'll design the ads, all of those types of things. And then we'll provide monthly reports showing you the results of the ad campaigns, how they're doing, and recommendations to improve you know, those campaigns. What's working well, what's not working so well, what else we recommend is the next step. So those are reports that you you know that we'll provide to you monthly so you can see you know exactly how well your ad campaigns are performing for you. We also offer a wide variety of social media marketing services. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time. There's there's several slides in here that I'm going to skip through, but again, they're going to be available to you um, on that PDF. Um, but social media marketing benefits for those of you who aren't out there or that aren't using social media yet, um, these are all of the different things that social media can do for you. Most importantly, social media can lead to account acquisitions and sales opportunities. So. You know, brand awareness and exposure is going to be a major goal. Obviously, being a partner with the community and, and you know, providing education, um, you know, is a major goal of social media. But at the end of the day, it will lead to account acquisition and sales opportunities. I cannot say that the time and money you spend in social media, um, you know, you're going to recover that 10 times over in new accounts and, you know, and, you know, and new sales, it's very hard to measure, but there are definite opportunities. You will have people messaging you and asking you questions through social media. Um, it is definitely a sales channel for many of our customers. Here's some reasons why to consider Facebook. I'm not going to read all of these to you, um, but know that they have one and a half billion monthly active users, over one billion daily active users, um, with over 150 million of those uh, in the U.S. and Canada. Um, these numbers are active as of September, or are current as of September. 30% of Americans get their news on Facebook. That's just huge. Um, Facebook covers all demographics as well. So, you know, we hear it all the time. Well, I, you know, it's only for younger, you know, the, the, the millennials that we want to reach, you know, that then I'll use Facebook, but that's not true. Actually, one of the highest growing segments of Facebook users are 65 plus. Twitter, while not as large, um, Twitter users are very, very active. Um, and, you know, Twitter provides some statistics, but it's amazing to me that over 5,700 tweets are sent every second. LinkedIn is particularly, you know, valuable for uh, targeting businesses and business users, business people. Um, what's interesting is that 13% of LinkedIn users don't have a Facebook account. 15, 59% don't use Twitter. 90% of LinkedIn users make household decisions. And I think this statistic is pretty important, too, that 13% of millennials use LinkedIn. A lot of people don't think of LinkedIn as a, as a place for the younger demographic, but it's growing there. Google Plus, I list Google Plus not because it's a tremendous 
social media platform. I, I think my opinion is that it's kind of failing miserably as a social media platform. But the fact of the matter is it's owned by Google, and Google has invested lots and lots of money into it. So why you should use Google Plus is going back to search engine optimization. Every post that you make to Google Plus gets a unique URL. Those posts are indexed by Google and presented in search results to drive people to look at Google Plus. Google also owns YouTube, so YouTube videos are predominantly featured on both Google Plus and inside of Google search results. Our recommendation is to post anything you're posting to Facebook to Google Plus as well. So it really doesn't cost you anything, and it provides huge benefits when it comes to search engine optimization. When you're using social media, you have to be social. So what that means is that you should post about three to five times per week. Think quality over quantity. You don't need to post multiple things per day. People don't honestly want to hear from their banks or credit unions multiple times per day. Um, and post new updates during business hours. The highest traffic, you know, if there's any CEOs on the call, you may not want to hear this, but the highest traffic occurs between 1 and 3 p.m. in the middle of the week. On Thursdays and Fridays, engagement is even higher. So people are using social media during work hours. And I hear it all the time, yeah, but, you know, a lot of companies block social media. And they do. They block it on their computers, but people are still accessing their social media accounts on their phones and their tablets. So what makes good content? Again, I'm not going to go through all of these slides in a whole lot of detail, um, but post photos and videos. You know, use links, and most importantly, use what I call the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of your status updates should give value to your fans first. They should be educational. They should be informative. They should be fun. 20% of your status updates can be promotional or brand first. So there's definitely a balance to strike. I believe it to be at right about 80-20. You want to post like a friend, not a brand. You know, the financial industry is full of jargon, you know, and acronyms and, and all of that. Not everybody understands that stuff. And just because it's very, very easy for us to use that jargon doesn't mean it's a great place, you know, that social media is not a great place to use it. So stay away from it, or maybe some of your posts should be, you know, just be like a dictionary and explain what APR or APY is. Um, not just annual percentage rate or annual percentage yield, but what it really means. And reply to fans when they comment on your status. They, people want to know that you're active on social media. They want a response when they reply to you. Social media comes with its challenges. So obviously, negative comments and brand reputation is the first challenge. Um, you know, you will be able to control where that conversation takes place. You know, people, I, I hear from customers all the time, we don't want people to complain. Well, if they don't complain on your Facebook page, they're going to complain somewhere else. So if they complain on your Facebook page, at least, A, you know about the complaint, and, B, you have the ability to respond to it and resolve the issue. And it will allow you to answer questions and solve issues you uncover. Demands on your time. I doubt that anybody on the call today is going to go out and hire somebody specifically for social media. <laughs> so you're going to be taking on social media on top of the other things you're already doing. So you have the ability, and you know, we'll discuss this a little bit, is to approve and publish social media content ahead of time. Um, you'll need to review and respond to posts and comments, but you can be notified of those as they come in. And you have to report on social media activity, but that can be automated as well. Constant growth and change is another social media challenge. These social media platforms are changing constantly. You know, there's new ones being added all the time. Um, and basically, you know, you need to select which sites you want to use. Um, monitor all social media sites for mentions and reviews so you can, you know, be notified of those. But build your, com you know, communities of followers on the social media platforms that you choose. And compliance. Obviously, that's the biggie. So the same rules and regulations apply as all other advertising. 
you know, we can help you, but, you know, you're going to need written policies and procedures regarding the use of social media, how you're monitoring social media. You're going to want to keep your management team and your board informed of how you're using social media. And you're going to want to train employees on the proper use of social media, both when they're using, you know, the banks or credit union social media sites and when they're using their personal social media profiles. Social media can be managed efficiently and affordably, but you're going to need a tool to do it. So there's a lot of tools that are out there. Um, these are some of the most popular ones. Um, we also have our own that we think is you know outstanding that we can show you. Um, just know that most of these will require you to pay for them. You know, some of them start out free, but very, very quickly you outgrow their free services. Um, so you're looking at budgeting for a social media monitoring platform, the good ones, at about $150 a month at the bottom end and over $1,500 a month at the very high end. But, you know, between $150 to $250 a month, you can get excellent social media monitoring tools to monitor just about any site. RSS feed blogs and things like that. What these platforms enable you to do is to publish all of your social media content across numerous social media sites at once. So you can publish to Facebook and YouTube and Google Plus and Twitter and all of that all from one place, including your text and your photos and your links. You'll be able to monitor all mentions and all comments you know, of your bank or credit union across social media as a whole, not just your profiles. It can, you know, pull information from review sites such as Yelp and Foursquare, you know, and the web in general for any mentions and inform you of them so you can respond to them. And it'll provide that reporting. So you'll have the ability to build and schedule custom reports, you know, and track a variety of different metrics to show you your effectiveness in social media. And we can help with all of that. Which brings us to website vulnerability scanning. So why do you need vulnerability scanning for your website? Well, when it comes, and what is vulnerability scanning as well? So when it comes to security, organizations, you know, companies and IT people think of hackers and external security threats and they immediately look at their firewalls and their access rules and their server configurations and operating systems and, and, and things like that. But really that's not where hackers are attacking now. What hackers have figured out is that those firewalls are really, really good. You know, and those web servers and those routers, they're hardened. They can't break in you know, anymore to take over the hardware of the website, you know, in the operating system. So they're actually attacking sites through the way that browsers interact with those websites. They're attacking web applications such as, you know, um, the forms on your website, blogs, through those content management systems, through login pages, through dynamic content. They're actually utilizing, they're using the programming of the website itself to attack the website. What they're trying to find are insecure web applications that give them access to back-end databases that store confidential data. And they're going to, you know, perform illegal activities on compromised sites. They want to change the content of your website, and they want to access all of the data that you're storing, um, you know, that are submitted, you know, all that confidential information that may be submitted through, you know, lead generation forms, loan applications, membership applications, all of those, you know, even just general information request forms. They want access to that information. They're attacking your sites. Hackers are attacking websites over HTTP and HTTPS, which reports 80 and 443 for those technical people on the call. But just like when you go to a web browser and you type in www.myfinancialinstitution.com, that's going to load that website over HTTP or HTTPS. The browser is going to pull up that web page just like a hacker would, only the hacker is looking at the code of that page while the rest of us are just looking at, you know, the pretty pictures and text that show up. But the hackers are going to try to interact and change 
different ways that they're calling web pages to try to find weaknesses in the web page code itself. Website vulnerability scanners used very sophisticated, these are sophisticated pieces of software that interact with those web pages to identify, it says here over 500 types of vulnerabilities. The different vulnerabilities are actually in the thousands. These scanning systems can even test areas of your websites that require secure logins. So, you know, a lot of times we're like, well, but they have to log into that part of the site to see it. Well, that doesn't mean that it's still secure behind that login. So we can actually utilize our scanners to log in, you know, with a demo account or something like that and test everything behind a secure login. The best scanning solutions take great pains to reduce false positives. We don't want to report a vulnerability that doesn't really exist. So we want to give you a succinct report of these are the issues that we found with your websites. Here are ways that hackers might be able to get control of your site or to retrieve confidential information from your website. And here are specific ways on how to fix those vulnerabilities. You know, these solutions can save valuable time for your IT department, you know, and your web developers. So what happens after, you know, each scan is, again, we will provide detailed reports that share the findings. You know, you'll see all of the different, you know, potential um, vulnerabilities that exist, along with examples of how to fix those and recommendations for fixing those. We'll even provide reports specifically on compliance. Um, when it comes to remediation, obviously you can choose to have your web developers fix any problems with your website, or our web team can potentially correct those vulnerabilities. Obviously, if it's a site we've designed, you know, we're ready to jump in and take care of it, but even if it's not a site uh, that we've designed, we may be able to help you. And obviously, we can rescan the site after weaknesses and vulnerabilities have been fixed to verify that they've actually been fully resolved. So the FFIEC recently came out with their cybersecurity assessment, which says that financial institutions must now scrutinize their exposure and ability to manage cybersecurity risks. And our vulnerability scanning solution will demonstrate that you have the ability to detect threats and vulnerabilities, which is a big piece of the cybersecurity assessment. So specifically, we can conduct that independent testing and vulnerability scanning that the FFIEC is recommending. We can perform those tests routinely, you know, on a regular basis, and we can execute tests, you know, these, these vulnerability tests before new websites are launched or, you know, as you're redesigning your site, you can test it even before it goes live to make sure vulnerabilities are addressed. We offer quarterly subscriptions for our scanning, or we're going to scan your site for vulnerability every three months. We also offer a semi-annual subscription where we scan every six months. And we offer an as-needed website scanning solution, where as you're preparing for an audit or an exam, we can scan your website. And the last thing I'm planning to talk about today are our online surveys. So we're switching gears entirely, um, but online surveys and online polls are very, very popular and they're getting less and less expensive. So when we look at traditional surveys versus online surveys, they're both the same in that somebody still has to write and design those surveys. So actually formulating the questions, that's the same process, whether you're launching a traditional survey or an online survey. But here's where they start to differ. Obviously, with a traditional survey, they have to be printed and sent out somehow, distributed. So we're looking at printing costs and mailing costs. With an online survey, you're looking at email costs. So if you're already utilizing some type of email marketing platform like we talked about, that cost is essentially zero to you. Certainly, if there's a cost, it's much, much lower than printing and mailing. With a traditional survey, people are going to return these surveys to you, and now somebody has to tabulate the results. With an online survey, the tabulation happens automatically, and there is no cost to it, and no tabulation. It's all done automatically. With a traditional survey, once those results are tabulated, somebody has to interpret the results and provide reports. With an online survey, those reports are available in real time right over to the web. 
With a traditional survey, obviously, you know, if somebody wanted to see further analysis, you know, so they saw something in the data and they wanted to slice or segment that data out, all of a sudden it needs to be retabulated based on the criteria for that further analysis. When it comes to online surveys, because all of the data is electronic, you can slice and dice it, compare answers to different questions very, very easily, filter out those results without retabulating. At the end of the day, a traditional survey is more time-consuming and expensive than an online survey. Online surveys also offer higher response, response rates, especially when you tag them with some kind of sweepstakes drawing, right? You know, we're going to randomly pick five people to win $100 that answered the survey, stuff like that. Um, it gives you the ability to adjust and change that survey, you know, as you think of new questions or implement new products or services, you know, you can modify an existing survey. It enables branching and skipping. So as somebody is actually answering questions on your survey, based on how they answer one question will determine whether or not they see other questions. They can take different paths through the same survey based on how they answer questions. Online surveys enable you to provide shorter, more frequent surveys. So rather than those multiple page surveys that I'm used to seeing from, from some banks and credit unions, you know, now you can ask a, a few questions at a time and do it throughout the year to get the information you need at a lower cost than sending out one big massive survey. And again, there's easy integration of sweepstakes and drawings to improve those responses. Online surveys offer very flexible formatting, so there are multiple question formats. You know, depending on how you want to ask your question, there's a way to present that question, you know, to the, to the people taking the survey. And obviously, they're in all of the online surveys integrate your branding. And the reporting is real time. So you have, you know, with LKCS's reporting solution anyway, or our survey solution, you'd access your own control panel or we can email results to you. You have the ability to look at cumulative responses, in other words, all of the answers to your surveys, or even down to the individual level. So if you wanted to see how one person answered all of the questions on their particular survey, you can see that. You can filter those results, as I've said, based on answers to other questions, export your results into an Excel spreadsheet, but you can see on the screen here how easy those results are to see. Um, and again, these happen in real time as people are taking the surveys. That's all I have for you. I've covered a ton of information, a ton of different services. I can literally spend an hour on just about any one of those solutions. So hopefully I've just given you enough information to pique your interest and, and have you start doing some research online about these different solutions. Obviously, I am available anytime to answer your questions or provide details or demonstrate any of the solutions that LKCS offers. But I wanted to give you an idea of, of what's out there and kind of how to take your website potentially to, to the next level um, in your online marketing efforts. So I greatly appreciate you know, your time today. Um, I will stay on the phone for a little while to answer any questions. Just feel free to type them into the GoToWebinar toolbar um, or feel free to contact me offline. Thank you very much.